Good morning. So is it just me or has anybody else out there ever made a fool of themselves? Okay, so a couple months ago, we were at a wedding. Um, The son of some very dear friends got married. It was an incredible celebration. Um, We were right there in the reception, had the best live band ever, and we were celebrating. I mean dancing. And if you know me, I love to dance. I look like a fool, whatever, I don't care. Here, I mean, you've got all these 20-year-olds, and they're like, "Ah," and I'm like, yeah, you know, and I'm just dancing with them. All that's great and wonderful. We get back to the house where we were staying. I head up the stairs where our room was, and I took my first step. I was like, oh, oh my gosh, I don't, oh my gosh, my quads hurt so bad. (laughs) And I thought, oh my goodness, what a complete fool I must have made out of myself because at this point, my legs hurt so bad, I couldn't even get up the stairs (laughs) to the room where we were staying. But it didn't matter because we were celebrating. I mean, there, it was such an incredible um, just event to be a part of. So I didn't care, my heart was full, and we just had a blast. So what in the world does that story have to do with what we're doing and talking about today? Well, we are in this series called The Ways of Jesus. We've been talking about these spiritual disciplines, these, these practices of faith that we need to cultivate so that we can grow closer to Christ, so that we can reflect our relationship. And so today, we're gonna talk about worship, which is really an interesting thing. I mean, like all the other spiritual disciplines we've been talking about, I mean, that makes sense, right? We're gonna confession, prayer, study, all these things. But today is about Worship, And I don't know about you, um, I'm not sure that growing up I really thought about worship as a spiritual discipline. But I want us to look at a passage, it's probably really familiar to a lot of you. It's in John chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up. Um, it's a story about the story about the Samaritan woman. Now, I, I'm just going to like get us to uh, through the story because I, there are just a few passages, a few verses that I want us to look at because Jesus talks about what worship is supposed to be. And so if you know the story, you know the story about the Samaritan woman. We have Jesus and the disciples, and they're walking to Galilee, and they go through Samaria, which is an unusual route because um, Jews and Samaritans don't usually interact. But, but Jesus has made this decision. We're going this route. They get there. It's hot. It's the middle of the day. They're exhausted. Jesus sends his disciples off to get food, and he goes to the well because he wants to get some, some water. Well, here comes a woman, middle of the day, to do her daily chore of getting water. Now, that's unusual because the middle of the day is not the time when you would normally go get your water at the well. But this woman did not have a good reputation. No one really liked her. There were a lot of things in her past that she was ashamed of. And so the best time to avoid everybody was the middle of the day. So she goes there, she meets Jesus, and um, she, he asks for water. And she said, well, okay. <laughs> so let me just remind you, um, Samaritans and Jews, we don't really interact, so you really probably shouldn't be asking me for water. And he says, actually, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for water, because I have living water. And she's like, that sounds like a good idea, yes. I would like that. May I have some, please? And, and then he says, sure, I'm happy to give it to you, but I want you to go home first, get your husband, and come back. He said that knowing full well that she was not married. In fact, she had already been with five men, part of the reason why she had this reputation. And so in this interaction, we come to this part of the conversation where I really want us to look at because she asks him about worship. So um, starting in verse 20, this is uh, her, this is the Samaritan woman talking to Jesus. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. 
woman, Jesus replied, by the way, that's not a bad thing. It's like saying, ma'am. So woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans, worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. So God, so we, we're supposed to worship in spirit and truth. What does that mean? Well, this woman is asking the question, where? Where is the right place to worship? Because I grew up, my family told me that there's this mountain, this is where Abraham sacrificed Isaac, so this is the proper place to worship. But you guys are saying it's somewhere else, so I'm so confused. But the problem is this woman, even in asking the question, what we see is that she has taken this idea of worship and she has so narrowed the focus and she has created a box. She's like, worship has to fit in this box where it's a proper place, a proper time, like this is the way to worship. It's almost like I told you that you could only have dinner if you were at your house, at your table, and at 6 p.m. Like if that was the box that I put dinner in, well, that would greatly reduce your ability to, um, you know, experience what dinner is. And so, so Jesus is like, no, no, you are, you're like making this box where you're limiting what you could experience of worship. And so what we actually learn and what we're going to really dive into is this lesson that tells us that worship isn't what we do. It's who we are. Worship isn't what we do. It's who we are. Worship is this expression of our relationship with Jesus as our creator, as our savior, as our redeemer. So the Samaritan woman is saying, where? Where am I supposed to worship? And Jesus said, no, 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 that's not the right question. The right question is about who and how. So let me talk to you about the who and the how. It's spirit and truth. Now we could put that on a bumper sticker and that would like probably look pretty good, but what does it really mean? What does it mean for us right here today? Well, this idea of worshiping in spirit, you know, the the Greek word for spirit is pneuma. It means breath. It's this indwelling spirit of God that's in our life. And, And so I know for a lot of us, if I came up to you, if I texted you and I said, okay, hey, I'm gonna go worship, you might think, oh, Susan is going to go to the Harvest Worship Space at 9.30, and she's going to get together with Brenna and Seth. Sort of like playing Clue. Remember Clue? Colonel Mustard in the living room with the candlestick, right? He's like, that's, that's might be what came to your mind if I said, hey, I'm gonna go worship. Now, that would be an excellent expression of worship, right? Absolutely. But it's not the only expression of worship. In fact, if, if we put worship in a box like that, then I don't know what to do with some of the other passages in Scripture. I mean, there's passages, there's Moses in Exodus. He, he's talking to Pharaoh, and he says, let my people go so we can go worship in the wilderness. Like, is that where we're supposed to worship? Because if so, we need to get up right now and we need to, like, leave. We need to go to the wilderness. Um, In Job, we learn that Job shaved his head, tore his robes, and fell down to worship. Is that worship? I'm kind of hoping not, right? I'm like, that is probably not the box that I want worship to stay in. Also, If we think that worship, if we put this box around this expression of worship that it has to be in a certain place at a certain time with certain people, then what do we do with things like house churches in China? What do we do with the soldiers that want to worship on the battlefield? What do we do with people who are worshiping on the beach? Is that real worship? 
Is that true worship? Is that worship in the spirit? It can be. It absolutely can be. Um, Richard Foster, who wrote a book called Celebration of Discipline, which is an incredible book if you wanna dive deeper, he says this. He says, forms and rituals do not produce worship, nor does the disuse of forms and rituals. We can use all the right techniques and methods. We can have the best possible liturgy, but we have not worshiped the Lord until spirit touches spirit. I love that phrase. We have not worshiped until spirit touches spirit. Isn't that a beautiful image? That's the image that I want us to have when we think about the spiritual discipline of worship. And of course, you know what? The Samaritan woman, not the only one who asked Jesus about worship. In fact, in Matthew 15, these uh, Pharisees, they corner Jesus and they're like, because they've been watching. They've been watching Jesus and the disciples and they're doing things like a little differently. And the Pharisees corner Jesus and say, hey, how come your disciples break tradition? How come they're not doing things the way we've always done it? Well, I love Jesus. Jesus just like flips the question. He goes, well, why are you breaking God's command just to keep with tradition? And in fact, in one of his little moments, this is Jesus's response to, uh, to the Pharisees. You hypocrites. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. The Pharisees had created this box, and they said, worship can only look like this. It has to fit in this box. It has to look like tradition, or it's not a way to worship God. Just like, that's, that's, not, that's not right. You don't understand. Another author, Donald Whitney, says, true worship cannot be diagrammed or calculated because it's the response of a heart in love with God. That's what worship is. Worship is a response, is a heart in love with God. It is the response of our heart. It's the response of our bodies. Like we just want to be in the presence of God. That is what true worship, that is what worship in the spirit is. And so what does that mean for us today? What does it mean for us here on Palm Sunday in the Woodlands? What is our worship supposed to look like? What, what should it look like? What, what can it look like? Well, I think what we need to do is just take a page out of Jesus's book and we need to flip the script. Because a lot of us, okay, I'll just talk about me. So sometimes I act like, okay, I've got to go to church and I've got to like listen to the singing. I got to let the prayers wash over me. Like I have to fill this cup. When my cup is empty, I just fill it, fill it. And if I fill it full enough, and then if I'm just careful enough, if I can just make it through, I'll just like pour out that cup throughout the week. And if I can just have enough that gets me through Saturday night, then I can come back and on Sunday, I can fill back up. I mean, like sometimes that's how I act. Like this Sunday, this worship time on Sunday is supposed to like last me throughout the week. But what if we flipped the script? What if we did something different? What if we took a page out of A.W. Tozer's book that said, if you will not worship God seven days a week, then you do not worship him one Day a week. What if we thought about what we're doing right here, right now on Sunday mornings as a potluck? Like everyone loves a potluck, right? I mean, potlucks are great. What if we spent Sunday as the day where we bring all of the worship that we've been doing for six days and we all bring it together right here, right now when we gather. 
Like you can bring the green bean casserole. Um, you can bring the jello salad. Uh, someone's got the tortilla pinwheels, uh, the pie, right? Like, like whatever it is, some of you are gonna have like this recipe passed down from your grandmother. Like you're known for it. Like you go make that and let's bring it all together so that when we gather, it's just a feast. Like we are bringing our worship together. So the, the problem is that sometimes our weeks get really busy. Sometimes we are just, we're in meetings, like we have homework, we have all these things. And then Sunday comes and we're like, oh, dang, I totally forgot the potluck. It's okay, I'll go to HEB. I'll get those cookies with the frosting. Everyone loves those. They'll be in the plastic container. It'll be fine. Right, that's okay. As long as you come, like, like, don't stay home because you didn't make something. Like, come, that's okay. We'll still feast together. Now, of course, the Pharisees, you know what they would have done. They would have called to the restaurant and they would have picked up something and then they would have put it in their own casserole dish. And they would have pretended like it was theirs. Like, ooh, look what I did all week. Mm-hmm. Right? No, 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 we're not supposed to do that. But sometimes I think that we just, man, we're busy, right? We're busy. The world is dragging a lot of things out of us. But what would happen if all of us were so busy and we didn't worship and we went, you know what, it's okay. Because I know Brenna and Seth have been cooking all week. I know Mark has got something, but it's fine. I'm just gonna go, we'll just go and we'll let them feed us. Well, that's okay if that's a couple of us, but if all of us did that, it's not much of a potluck. That's basically inviting us ourselves to their house and say, please feed me. I mean, I'm not, you know, I like what we need to do is worship for six days a week. We need to worship on Monday and worship on Tuesday and worship on Wednesday. And like all week long, we just fill up our cup and then when we come together, it's a pot luck. This is a feast. That's what worship on Sundays is supposed to be. But if we are gonna do that, if we're gonna treat worship as a spiritual discipline, just like we do prayer, just like we do our study, just like all that stuff, then I think there's a phrase that we need to learn. This is my worship. Say it with me. This is my worship. So, you know, we, we uh, practice these things all week before we come and, and preach the word, right? So, so that has been my job all week, it's like that I'm like, okay, everything that I do, I'm gonna use it as a way to worship the Lord. This is my worship, this is my worship. And I'll tell you that there have been some times this week that that's gone pretty well. <laughs> I've gathered with people, I've prayed over them, we worked on some incredible plans for Holy Week services. Like I felt really good about saying, this is my worship. This is my worship, Lord. Your spirit and my spirit, they touch. This is a response of my heart, out of my love for you, yes. And then there have been other times where things have come out of my mouth and I've gone, this is, Oh, not so much, right? But if we work really hard at looking at the things that we do in our lives and we go, this is my worship, this is my worship, I am going to respond to God out of the love that I have for him every single day, then by the time we get to Sunday night, we're like, I cannot wait to get to church on Sunday because we are going to have a potluck like no one's business because everyone is bringing their best. Everyone is bringing what they have worked so hard on and what they have labored over and what they have, the time that they have spent with God all week. And then we bring it together. Yes, like that's what worship on Sundays is supposed to feel like. And it doesn't even matter. It's not like you have to like 
click on the music and dance around your kitchen, though I have done that this week as well, right? But it can be the, the things, the mundane things. It can be your quiet time in the morning. It can be your drive time to work. It can be your time sitting in the car pickup line. Yes, that can be worship, right? It's all those little things. You know why I know that can be true? Because the Samaritan woman did not go to the well for worship. She went to the well because she needed to complete her daily chore. And it was in the middle of that daily chore that she encountered the Messiah, that she encountered the presence of God in her midst, and she heard the words, this is worship, worship in spirit and truth. So here she is in, in worship, and, and when we think of worship, this image that's supposed to come to mind, it doesn't matter if you read scripture, if you read in the Old Testament, you read in the New Testament, like this word worship, whether it's Hebrew or Greek, it's the same. It's this image, it's this idea of coming and just bowing down. It's this image of vulnerability. It's this image of authenticity. It's this image of recognizing that there is one greater that you wanna respect and honor. This is my worship because of who you are, because you are the creator, because you are the Messiah, because you are my redeemer. And so when we are worshiping in truth, that means we have to be authentic. That means we have to be vulnerable. There is um, a person in the scripture that I think is a great example of what it means to worship being authentic and vulnerable, and that's David. If you read through the Psalms, you hear his words. You hear the times when he talks, and he's like, I mean, there are like, really, I am like, I am laying myself out because I'm going through a terrible time, and yet I'm gonna come and be in your presence, Lord. And there are times of, of great joy. I mean, just let me just read a few of the words that David wrote as his authentic and vulnerable expression of worship. From Psalm 3:1, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? I mean, can you imagine what had, was going on in his life at that point? How about Psalm 5.1? Listen to my words, Lord. Consider my lament. Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. I mean, that must have been a great day. How about Psalm 9? I will give my thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of your wonderful deeds. It will be glad, I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. David, when he worshiped, he was authentic. He was vulnerable. He didn't really care about trying to keep up appearances. He didn't care what other people thought about him. In fact, one of my favorite stories I have to share with you uh, comes from uh, the uh, second Psalm, uh, Samuel, second Samuel. Uh, and so to understand what David did, you have to understand, you have to go back just a, a little bit. So um, before David was king, when Saul was king, so Saul, the Il, um, Israelites and the Philistines were fighting. Uh, the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant, sacred object, right? Philistines took it back to their camp. God would smite them. All these things were going wrong. Philistines decided to play hot potato. They were like, get rid of this thing, get rid of this thing, send it back, send it back. They put it on a cart and they're like, go, go, go. We do not want it anymore, right? So then some time passed. David becomes a king. Then the Israelites and the Philistines were fighting again. David decides he wants to take this Ark of the Covenant. I guess he didn't want them to steal it again. And he's like, we got to take it to Jerusalem because we're going to worship there. So we got to get it there fast. Now, there are rules about how to move the Ark of the Covenant. You have to have priests. You got to have it on a pole. You got to walk it. He's like, no, no, no. We got to get it there fast. Let's go. We were talking about where it needs to go and how fast. So they put it on a cart. 
put on a cart, like let's move it, move it, move it. Unfortunately, the cart was a little wobbly, clearly didn't have engineers working on it. The Ark of the Covenant starts to look like the fall. This one guy puts his hand up to steady it. (laughs) Wrong move, he dies. Don't do that. David sees that. He's like, ooh, we're going to get rid of this. Look, there's Obed-Edom's house. Let's put it there. Come on, quick. Let's just put this ark in Obed-Edom's house, and let's move away. Well, the Ark of the Covenant in Obed-Edom's house, um, everything flourished for him. I mean, blessings on his family, blessings on his house. And when David hears that, he's like, oh, my gosh. I did it wrong. I was so worried about where we were supposed to worship. I was so worried about like, let's hurry up and do this thing that I forgot that God told us the right way to do it. So David goes back and he goes, we gotta go get the ark from Obed-Edom's house and we have to do it the right way. We have to to, um, take this ark of the covenant and we have to listen to what God says. So so in 2 Samuel, um, we'll read this story because this is really good. This is also a little marital advice that we're gonna get to, so this this story is great. So 2 Samuel, now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying, notice they didn't put on a cart this time, they did it right, carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, get this, six steps, they stopped and he sacrificed a bull and fattened calf. Notice the first time David was worried about, let's get it there and let's do this fast. The second time he said, no, it's not about how quickly we can do it. It's about honoring God with what we're doing. So they take six steps and then they begin to sacrifice a bull and a calf. Now, this is a long process. And as I was reading this, I thought, oh, how often do I think, okay, like let's, let's get going, like let's move along, let's get this, this thing, we're gonna gather, we're gonna worship, and then I have so much to do, right? How many times do we rush through something instead of stopping and just spending time and really worshiping God no matter how long it takes? So then let's keep reading. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, that's David's wife, daughter of Saul, watched from a window, guys, get this, and when, he, when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Women, have you ever been embarrassed by your husband? Right, like I can just see, I can just see her like going, really? So embarrassing. Dagger to the heart, guys, because um, David was right, McCall was wrong, all right? Let's keep reading. They brought the ark of the Lord, set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. David sacrificed burnt offerings, fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, a cake of raisins to each person and the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women and all the people went to their homes. Guys, they had a potluck, right? I mean, they are going to worship. And then when David returned home to bless his household, right? He is, his heart is full. He has been worshiping, he has been sacrificing, he's ready, he is ready to come home and bless his household. And what happens? McCall, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. What a missed opportunity, guys. David said to McCall, 
It was before the Lord. It was before the Lord. Don't you see what I was doing? He chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. See, David had one audience for his worship. It was God. He didn't care about keeping up appearances. He didn't care what people thought when he was dancing before the Lord because it was his authentic and vulnerable worship. And he said, yeah, you know what? I'm gonna be undignified if it honors God. I am gonna be undignified in my worship. And if you don't like it, I'm so sorry. And you know what? It's actually really easy to be undignified when we are passionate about something. Okay, when your kids are at a concert or if they are playing in a sport, what are you? You are the paparazzi. You don't care. You got that camera. First of all, I saw y'all just a few moments ago, okay? You got your camera up. Whoop, whoop, number 12, like whatever. Like you are, you don't care. You can be undignified. That is your kid. You are excited. Come on, I'll jump up and shout, right? Look, some of y'all have seen me in Aggie games. I'm willing to say that, but I also watched some of y'all during March Madness. So it's not just me, right? But what would it look like, guys, if our worship was that? If we didn't care, if we were willing to be undignified for our worship, what does that look like? Romans 12, one says, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper what? Worship. This is what it is. We have to be willing to sacrifice. That might mean our time. That might even mean our pride. Like I loved these children. I don't know whose kid was right here. Y'all, that was so good. That was so good. Yes, yes. Those kids were not up here going, oh my gosh, I wonder what they're gonna think about me. No one was waving a palm like, oh no. Like if we had given you a palm when you walked in and said, oh, by the way, in just a minute, you're gonna walk around. And like how many of us would go, oh, yep. Can I go to the sanctuary? Are they doing that in the sanctuary? Right, you know, we have to be willing to be undignified because we are so passionate about God and what he has done. We have to be willing to just be vulnerable We have to be willing and wanting His Spirit to touch our spirit. We want to have our heart poured out as a response to who God is in our hearts. Like, look, when our students gather together, I love it. They're like jumping up and down. Look, this 52-year-old body has a 22-year-old spirit inside. And if my knees would keep up, I would be up there right with them. My sweet friend who loves Graves to Gardens, Every Sunday, right, Daniel? Graves the garden, why? There's nothing better than this. There's nothing better. Being undignified in our worship, yeah, that's true. Come on, if we're gonna worship God, sometimes it's messy. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes it's undignified. But do you know why it's important? I'll tell you why, because the Samaritan woman who no one really wanted to associate with, when she encountered the Christ, the Messiah, do you know what she did? She ran back to the town with all the people who made fun of her, all the people who didn't wanna be with her because she had to tell them what she knew. She wanted them to be part of this worship. And do you know what happened? Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. How many people 
might come to know the living Christ because they see you worship, because they see how you worship on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And when you bring your full self here on Sunday and it is a big old potluck of everyone's worship together, whose life might be changed because we're willing to be undignified like this? So I will tell you, I asked Brenna to sing the loudest, proudest, biggest, most obnoxious worship song ever to end. You, you worship how you want to, but I'm gonna be over here being undignified. <laughs>